Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Silva. Thank you for joining me for this talk on Temazepam, Restoril. I just did a two-part series overview on the benzodiazepines, but I left out poor Temazepam, and I've prescribed plenty of it, so I had to follow up with this coda to that presentation. Please check it out. Temazepam is a benzodiazepine, a hypnotic agent, hypnosis meaning sleep and benzos are GABA positive allosteric modulators. GABA is gamma aminobutyric acid, the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. Allosteric modulators bind to one site on the GABA A receptor, the benzodiazepine binding site, which leads to a conformational change in the physical structure of the receptor, a protein, and this structural change makes it more likely that endogenous GABA will bind to another site on the receptor, the GABA binding site. This is analogous to the way that enzymes help to accelerate chemical reactions. Enzymes catalyze reactions, that is, they make them more likely to happen, by binding their substrates in a puzzle piece fashion, holding them in such a way that the chemical bond breaking and bond forming processes take place more readily. Enzymes stabilize that transition state. Similarly, when a benzodiazepine like temazepam binds the GABA-A receptor protein, the protein changes configuration to the point of increasing the likelihood that GABA itself will attach to the receptor elsewhere on the receptor. So, like enzymes, benzodiazepines are facilitators. And what's important about that is that benzodiazepines don't stimulate GABA receptors. They're not agonists. They're not direct agonists. They only serve to increase the likelihood that GABA itself will stimulate that receptor. And this is what makes them relatively safe in overdose. Because even if we saturate the benzodiazepine receptors in the central nervous system with an overdose of temazepam, let's say, that only increases the affinity of those receptors for endogenous GABA. But there's only so much GABA to go around, so an overdose victim would rarely stop breathing entirely. Not unless they had combined the overdose with alcohol, opioids, or other sedatives that likewise depressed the respiratory drive. In contrast, the barbiturates, medications like phenobarbital and amobarbital, which have their own unique binding sites, and which are also positive allosteric modulators of the GABA-8 receptor, also stimulate the receptor directly. They mimic GABA. And so if a person takes enough, not only will they be comatose, but saturating those receptors throughout the CNS can lead to central asphyxiation and death, all by themselves. So the benzos are relatively safe, even when the overdose is intentional. It's not impossible to die overdosing on just a benzodiazepine, but it's very unlikely you would have to take just a massive amount. Temazepam is FDA approved for the short-term treatment of insomnia. By short-term, we usually mean seven to 10 days, but it is used off-label and I myself have used it more chronically in the treatment of primary insomnia for months or even years on end. This is slightly controversial. There's some concern about increasing a person's risk of dementia and cancer as a result of chronic benzodiazepine therapy but nothing's been established there. There's no smoking gun, in my limited opinion. In recommending and prescribing any medication, it's always a risk-benefit analysis. Right now, the risk of increasing the risk of developing dementia as a result of chronic treatment with a medication like temazepam is purely theoretical. Research on the association between chronic benzodiazepine use and dementia is mixed, with some studies suggesting a connection and others finding no increased risk. And so positive findings haven't been well replicated. And a study that can't be consistently replicated can't be validated. An umbrella review of meta-analyses published in the Journal of Personalized Medicine in 2023 
found little evidence that older adults prescribed benzodiazepines are at increased risk of developing dementia. Other studies have also found no association between benzodiazepine use and the risk of dementia. So for now, the short answer too late is no, benzodiazepines do not cause, nor do they appear to increase the risk of dementia in the elderly. Falling, on the other hand, is a much greater, definite, and more immediate concern in this patient population. Benzodiazepines definitely greatly increase that risk, and so we have to be very careful there. I'm not saying that we should be cavalier, but when we're talking about short-term use versus long-term use, patients can fall in the short term too. So as long as the medication continues to work, continues to be a benefit, and the risk-benefit analysis is conducive, there's nothing to indicate that long-term treatment is dangerous in and of itself. As far as the carcinogenicity of benzodiazepines, again, no strong evidence there that benzodiazepines cause cancer. The studies I looked at had poor controls, major lifestyle variables such as alcoholism and even smoking were unaccounted for. Temazepam is a capsule. It comes in four strengths from seven and a half milligrams to 30 milligrams with the usual dosing being 15 milligrams. It has a half-life of only 8 to 15 hours, so it's considered a short-acting agent. And in general, we reserve the short-acting agents to bedtime for use as hypnotic agents. On the other end of the spectrum, agents with really long half-lives like Librium and Clonopin are best to treat withdrawal syndromes, including alcohol withdrawal. The long half-lives are conducive to weaning off of sedatives. There's less rebound. Anyway, I highly recommend the videos that I just posted on benzodiazepines if you want an overview. Temazepam is unique in that it is very slowly absorbed from the GI tract. So administering the dose a couple of hours before bedtime might improve its onset of action and shorten sleep latency. Sleep latency being the time between lying down and finding sleep, sleep onset. Because of the slow absorption compared to other benzodiazepines, it might be more effective for nocturnal awakening called middle insomnia than for trouble falling asleep unless you dose it a couple of hours before bedtime. So it's something to keep in mind. And this is different from most sleeping pills. I tell my patients typically take it as you're getting into bed. I make a big deal about good sleep hygiene. And when you're taking medication, there's another video that I do about how to make your sleeping pill keep working. I tell my patients, don't take your medicine and then go check your email and watch a little TV, and brush your teeth, take it and hit the pillow. Take it, it lights out on an empty stomach. Within 10 to 15 minutes, 20 minutes max, you should be falling asleep. But temazepam is different in that regard. So that should be taken into consideration. Like all benzodiazepines, temazepam is a schedule four drug. That's four out of five. With the higher the number, the less controlled the agent. So the DEA considers them to be less dangerous and less potentially habit forming than a lot of other controlled substances. Dependence is certainly possible with temazepam though, and the risk may be greater with higher doses. We have to be careful, especially in patients with a history of chemical dependency. Alcoholism in particular is a relative contraindication. There's an extremely high incidence of cross addiction in my experience. It's not necessarily an absolute contraindication. I wouldn't say absolutely never, but personally, I would have greater confidence prescribing temazepam to a person who had abused cocaine in the past and whose drug of choice were stimulant and stimulating substances as opposed to alcohol, or for that matter, opiates. Patients who love and who have had trouble with downers really shouldn't be treated with benzodiazepines, at least not for more than a few days. Side effects. Well, sedation, when we don't want it, as a carryover effect, because it's in a capsule with the lowest possible dose of seven and a half milligrams, it's intended as a sleep aid. And I've never tried to use it for anxiety during the day. It's, it certainly would work for that, but even the lowest dose might induce sedation. And so like Ambien and Halcyon, it's reserved for bedtime only. It's never really, it's never prescribed 
for daytime use because you can get daytime sedation with it. It's all or none. It's a capsule. Diurnal sedation is also possible with any benzodiazepine which is used diurnally, including Xanax and Valium, but those come in smaller doses and the tablets are scored. So you can always break those up into small pieces. You can't do that with temazepam. Fatigue and depression have been reported with sedatives. Some depressed patients might experience a worsening of their suicidal ideation if their depression worsens. You want to be careful using sedatives in patients whose depressions are characterized by psychomotor retardation and low energy and low motivation, low drive, cognitive symptoms, dizziness, ataxia, which is an unsteady gait, as well as slurred speech, dysarthria, and weakness are possible, but those are really more signs of intoxication. Still, they can occur in mild form as side effects if the dose is a bit too high. You shouldn't be walking around or talking after taking temazepam, right? It's a sleeping pill. So the problem there is that you got out of bed, which can happen with these short-acting agents once tolerance develops. Waking up in the middle of the night, middle insomnia, and getting up and getting out of bed is a particular concern with agents that are in this class, benzodiazepines that have a short half-life. My favorite benzodiazepine to use at bedtime is actually Ativan, which is medium-acting, and that doesn't tend to carry over despite its longer half-life. If you take the medicine and you stay awake, then you can experience the typical cognitive side effects that benzodiazepines give you. Forgetfulness, confusion, difficulty concentrating, and other signs of cognitive dulling. You're supposed to be asleep anyway, but these are potential carryover effects. So especially the next morning, there might be some cognitive dulling for a little while. One specific type of forgetting is called anterograde amnesia, which is having total forgetfulness, amnesia, in the period of time following dosing, which is what is meant by anterograde as opposed to retrograde. It's the same phenomenon as an alcoholic blackout. People are awake during blackouts. They're conscious. They just aren't recording. There's a threshold above which benzodiazepine serum concentrations hit the pause button in the hippocampus and the person stops making memories. This is essentially the same process as what you see in dementia or cannabis intoxication. The pathophysiology may be different. In Alzheimer's, it's degeneration of the brain, plaques and tangles, and with pot, it probably has something to do with blocking the action of acetylcholine, but the short circuit happens in the hippocampus in any state in which you're not forming new memories. Disinhibition is another potential side effect, again, if you happen to be awake. We don't talk about these side effects a lot with medications that we just give at bedtime because we assume that the patient is going to be asleep. But if you have a bed partner, you can definitely, you might say things that you wouldn't have said ordinarily. Paradoxical reactions are always possible. Hyperexcitability and nervousness have been reported. These are rare and certain patient populations are at greater risk, especially patients with dementia. Those patients are unpredictable and they might experience disinhibition and confusion, two very common, not unlikely side effects that are not at all paradoxical. And those can lead to grossly disorganized and agitated behavior that mimic anxiety. Temazepam doesn't cause weight gain unless you get up in the middle of the night and raid the fridge because you're disinhibited, which does happen. A word of caution to you foodies out there, and people with food addiction especially. This happens especially with short-acting agents that wear off before morning. So-called sleep eating is pretty famous with Ambien, which is another very short-acting agent. Contraindications, obviously sedative hypnotic use disorder, for sure. If you're addicted to Xanax, you shouldn't take temazepam, can't do it. Alcoholism, almost certainly, with few exceptions, and then only in the short term. If you're allergic to any benzodiazepine, they all share the same basic chemical structure, so you want to be very careful. It's similar to not giving ampicillin when a person is allergic to penicillin. 
If a patient is pregnant, although benzodiazepines are not major teratogens. Floppy baby syndrome, hypotonia has been reported in newborns that are exposed to benzodiazepines. Withdrawal is also possible in the neonate, but major birth defects have not been seen. There's a question about whether the incidence of cleft palate might be increased in fetus that has been exposed to high concentrations of benzodiazepines. It's, it's frowned upon in pregnancy. If a patient has angle closure glaucoma, narrow angle glaucoma, benzodiazepines relax the pupillae muscles, which causes dilation of the iris and the pupil, and that can lead to an ophthalmic crisis in patients with narrow angle glaucoma. There's an FDA boxed warning about combining benzodiazepines and opioid medications. Uh, the possibility of slowed or difficult breathing, respiratory suppression that can lead to death. And we need to be careful prescribing any medication that depresses the respiratory drive in any patient that already has impairment in their oxygen exchange. For example, patients with obstructive sleep apnea that stop breathing multiple times a night, especially if it's poorly controlled and they're not using a machine, a CPAP machine. In 2020, the FDA updated the black box warning for benzodiazepines to include information about the risks of abuse, misuse, addiction, physical dependence, and withdrawal reactions. Besides sleep, what else do we use temazepam for? Not much. It's a sleeping pill. It could be used to treat catatonia, which is a, an uncommon psychotic symptom. I won't get into it here, but benzodiazepines are first-line treatment for catatonia. And so it's really, catatonia is thought to be a form of anxiety. It's thought to be a problem in the, in the anxiety circuits, the fear circuits in a patient who is acutely psychotic. I'm going to do a video on that. It's very interesting. But so you could use temazepam for anxiety too. It just wouldn't be very convenient because you have these capsules and this all or nothing dosing. But like triazolam, like Halcyon, it's only approved as a hypnotic agent. Thank you for listening. Please check out my other videos on the benzodiazepines.